On the afternoon of May 29, 1957, the body of 67-year-old director James Whale, fully dressed in a suit and tie, was found floating face down in the pool of his Pacific Palisades estate. James Whale was the director of some of Hollywood's classic horror films, including Frankenstein and The Bride of Frankenstein. In the 1930s, Whale was one of Tinseltown's most respected and highly paid directors. But this Englishman's private life was shrouded in secrecy, and his puzzling death was as eerie as any film he ever made. During the course of the police investigation, lurid details about homosexual escapades in the same swimming pool shocked his Hollywood friends and colleagues. But how did James Whale end up dead? Was it an accident, suicide, or was it murder? James Whale, as we know, had an invented past. When he became so prominent after the uh, making of Frankenstein, he would tell interviewers sometimes that he had tutors when he was a child and uh, came from a very aristocratic background. And we'll examine the sordid stories about Whale's personal life. The rumors ar arose Whale was hosting orgies at his Pacific Palisades home. Finally, we'll sort through the theories surrounding his mysterious death. There had been poolside parties, uh, mainly with hustlers, and that he'd gotten into a row with one and been pushed into the pool by, by accident, and the whole thing was a cover-up. Rumors beyond suicide circulated, uh, death by homosexual rage of another lover, that kind of thing. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we unravel the mystery behind the death of director James Whale. Did he create a monster that destroyed his life? The morning of May 29, 1957, began like any other for retired film director James Whale. But at 2.25 that afternoon, a member of Whale's household staff made a startling discovery. Whale biographer Jim Curtis. The body was found by a maid who had called down to him over the intercom because lunch was ready. When he didn't respond, she went down, saw the body, panicked. Film historian Greg Mank continues. And of course, she was amazed to see him in the pool because he didn't swim. Of course, he was fully clothed as well. And she realized that something terrible had happened. And within minutes, the police were there along with his business manager. The body was fished out of the pool. The only noticeable injury was a bump on Wells' forehead. Because of the blow on the head, that led to some of the rumor that perhaps he had been beaten or uh, killed or something the night before and actually thrown into the pool. Now the question became, how did James Whale end up in the pool? Well, not so fast. See, to fully understand the man and his story, we really have to take a look at his intriguing past. James Whale was a man who kept many secrets, not the least of which was the truth about his ancestry. In America, Whale presented himself as an English aristocrat, but in reality, the Whale family was not likely to be found sipping tea with the queen. More likely, they were serving it. James Whale came from a very poor background. Uh, he was born in the black country, which is in uh, England. Uh, he came from a mining family. His father was a blast furnace man. He was born in uh, July 22, 1889. James Whale was very much part of the Victorian era. The Sherlock Holmes stories were just being written. Uh, Jack the Ripper was still at large. He was a very sensitive young man. He had artistic talent, dramatic ability, and was really something of a fish out of water in his surroundings. He had no right to expect anything other than a life of hard labor. Film historian Anthony Sly. The First World War really marked a, um, a major turning point in Wales' life. Here was a working class boy who suddenly was able to go to officer training school. For the first time he was mixing with a class that he had never met before. That there was this intense awareness in a young Englishman with ambition to be a gentleman. Oddly enough, the First World War was the best thing that could have happened to the 25-year-old James Whale. Stranger still is the fact that it was his capture by the Germans in 1917 and his 15 months in a POW camp that inspired Whale to pursue a career in theater. In the camps, he started putting on amateur dramatics, and I think for the first time began to think that maybe there was the opportunity of a career on stage for him. When the war ended in 1918, Whale moved to London, where for the next 10 years he was a very successful director and actor. He had the opportunity to direct a play called Journey's End by R.C. Sheriff. The play dealt with men in the trenches during the First World War. 
It was almost as if Whale was reading the story of his own life. Gary Don Rhodes has studied the life of James Whale. In 1929, Whale's success in England with Journey's End, the stage version, brought him to America at about age 40 to do the same. The success of the stage version here led to a film version that really became the, uh, the linchpin of his career. So at 40 years old, James Whale was starting a new life in America. Whale was immediately embraced by Hollywood's movie elite thanks to his talent, his charm, and his aristocratic demeanor. Nobody seemed to suspect the guy was a major phony. But Whale was very honest about one aspect of his life. He was openly homosexual at a time when no one was that open in sexuality in Hollywood. Shortly after moving to Hollywood, Whale met a story editor at Paramount named David Lewis. The two became lovers. Lewis was 15 years younger than Whale. James Whale and David Lewis lived openly in Los Angeles at that time together. They were always thought of as a couple. Uh, I'm not sure in the early 30s the people really gave a damn about two gay men living together. Gavin Lambert was a close friend of James Whale. There was the famous remark that Mrs. Patrick Campbell was supposed to have made, I don't care what they do as long as they don't frighten the horses. But James Whale's first hit movie was going to frighten everybody. The 1931 horror classic Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff, would change horror films forever and launch Whale as a big-time Hollywood director. Straight ahead, the brief glory days of James Whale. How did the kindly self-styled English gentleman end up playing host to poolside orgies? Was it Whale's preoccupation with the dark side that eventually cost him his life? In the early 1930s, film director James Whale was building a name for himself as the father of the modern horror film. Whale, who arrived in Hollywood in 1929 at the age of 40, had also reinvented himself as an English gentleman. Surprisingly, Whale's openly homosexual relationship with his young lover was tolerated at a time when gay still meant happy. You might ask yourself why Hollywood was so accepting. Well, because ticket sales for Whale's first hit film, Frankenstein, went through the roof. And in this town, nothing breeds tolerance like cash flow. Frankenstein opened in New York City on December 4th, 1931, and it was show business history. For Whale, it was an incredible success. Suddenly, overnight, found himself really at the peak of his profession. In two weeks' time in Los Angeles, over 120,000 people saw it. Upon its initial release in 1931, Frankenstein was, was unlike anything audiences had ever seen before. But despite the film's success, the story of a man-made monster created controversy. Morality groups cry out, religious persons cry out. People are saying we shouldn't watch films like Frankenstein. They're simply too horrifying. They're addressing things like man trying to emulate God. Some suggest Whale had an entirely different interpretation of the Frankenstein story, one that really would have sent those morality groups on a rampage. I think a gay man might empathize with the monster. Here is somebody who doesn't fit in with society, whom the peasants, the normal, in quote, people, set out to destroy because he's different. I would say almost an obsessive project for Whale. The thing that had the most startling possibilities, really, for Whale was the whole concept of the story of Frankenstein, a man creating another man. It's alive, it's alive. Whale's next monster hit was the sequel to Frankenstein called The Bride of Frankenstein. At first, Whale didn't want to do the film because he was worried that he would be typecast as just a horror film director. But in 1935, he finally relented and made uh, The Bride of Frankenstein. That, uh, that film, I believe, is, is really where you see all of his interests come together. So The Bride of Frankenstein really became probably the most personal vision of Whale's career. The Bride of Frankenstein, starring Elsa Lanchester as the bride, was a huge box office hit, even bigger than Frankenstein. Certainly in the, in the period from about 1933 to 1936, Whale was at the height of his power as a director, probably one of the best paid directors in Hollywood. Whale began to enjoy the trappings of success. In 1937, Whale and his companion David Lewis moved into a lavish estate in Pacific Palisades. The two seemed to live a very sort of quiet existence. They didn't seem to go out to Hollywood parties. But Lewis, like Whale, was open about his homosexuality. If it came up, if the subject didn't come up, then, then obviously Lewis wouldn't discuss it. For a while, life was good for James Whale, but that was all about to change. Straight ahead, how did a run-in with the Nazis eventually destroy Whale's film career? And what sent him down the hedonistic path to ruin? 
Director James Whale was a pioneer in the world of horror movies, but his real life story proved to be as ghastly as anything he ever put on celluloid. I'm A.J. Benza from Mysteries and Scandals. After the success of Frankenstein and The Bride of Frankenstein, Whale was at the top of the Hollywood food chain. He was beginning to branch out into other genres as well. In 1936, 47-year-old Whale helmed the hit musical Showboat, proving his range as a director. But Whale's tenure at the top didn't last long. Things started to go wrong for James Whale after the Lemley family sold Universal Pictures in 1936. New owners and new management came in. They weren't accustomed to giving directors such as James Whale the free reign that he had had previously. The Roadback was the first film he was making for the new administration at Universal. It was crucial that he make a hit. He proved to them that he was a competent director. The film starred a young actor named Larry Blake. His son, Michael Blake, recalled the 1937 production. It was quite a big thing back then at Universal. I mean, the whole talk on the whole lot, James Wales rode back, and everybody wanted to be in it. Everybody wanted to work with Whale. The Road Back was an anti-war movie about World War I, which painted the Germans in a very bad light. Adolf Hitler, not known for being a good sport, started making threats. James Whale suddenly found himself under siege. The German government did not want the road back filmed in 1937, and the German consul in Los Angeles had sent letters to the cast members warning them. These are the most outrageous, blatant threats. James Whale, he refused to meet with the German consul and proceeded to make a film that was in some ways as uncompromising as any war film ever put on film up to that point. But although the Hollywood moguls were all Jewish, their primary concern was selling their films in Europe and, and in Germany, which is a big market. So they were very anxious to compromise with the Nazis in Germany. Keep in mind, folks, that this was 1937, a couple years before things got really ugly in Europe. The Nazi party stepped in and basically sabotaged the film. They tried to intimidate the people who were in it. After the film was done, they demanded cuts in the film, and Universal, amazingly, caved and made 21 cuts and shot new footage, mostly lame comedy footage. Did you fight in the war? Yes, we finished it up last Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs> he accused the studio of virtually sucking up to Adolf Hitler. Well walked, so the studio recut the film without him. As a result, uh, the film was critically savage as well as commercially unsuccessful, and James Whale's career never recovered from it. Whale not only lost interest in this film, per se, and the way it was taken away from him by the studio heads and the whole problem with the German situation, but I think it just kind of bled in and spilled into the other films. The spark that he had was missing from Whale. James Whale made another seven feature films. By the time he made his last film in 1941, he was disgusted with Hollywood. James Whale, now 52 years old, had become a liability, and Universal Studio execs were looking for any excuse to show him the door. When it came time to try to push James Whale out of the picture, the homosexuality became another tool that the front offices possibly used. Funny how Whale's personal life was never a problem when his movies were making money. But in 1942, James Whale's contract was not renewed. The extraordinary thing about his career was it was so brilliant and so brief, really, because he arrived in Hollywood, I think, in 29 or 30, and really he was almost out 10 years later. James Whale may have been a proper English gentleman in the beginning, but he was about to make up for lost time. When we come back, we'll look at the wild parties and the poolside debauchery at Whale's palatial Oceanview estate begin to unravel the mystery behind his puzzling death. By 1942, director James Whale was washed up in Hollywood. He'd taken on the Nazis and the Hollywood establishment and lost. So the 53-year-old settled into a quiet life of leisure in his Pacific Palisades estate with his longtime lover, David Lewis. The problem was that Lewis was now a successful producer. That made Whale even angrier about the loss of his own career. Well became more and more frustrated with his life, which obviously didn't help his relationship with Lewis. Whale seems to be slowly going to pieces, so he was becoming embittered uh, with the fact that he, at this stage he was now a forgotten Hollywood director. James Whale got the idea to take an extended tour of uh, Europe and England, and he wanted David to come with him. David said no, he, he preferred to stay in California. In 1952, 63-year-old Whale headed to Paris alone. 
friend and film director Curtis Harrington joined Whale in France. When we were in Paris, he met a young Frenchman. And uh, I didn't like this person because he was low class. And I thought he was just, you know, out for what he could get out of Jimmy. The young Frenchman was named Pierre Fogel. Pierre Fogel would have been about 25. And uh, he brought him back with him from Paris uh, to Pacific Palisades. And that ended, of course, the situation with David Lewis, who very understandably moved out at Pierre's arrival. So after 24 years, Whale and Lewis split up, and the young Frenchman moved in. James found a very clever way to explain away his new companion to his friend, Gavin Lambert. James, he decided that he wanted me to know the score. If I hadn't already twigged what it was, um, he introduced uh, Pierre to me one day as, uh, oh, this is Pierre, my <coughs> chauffeur. But within months, Whale grew bored with his new chauffeur. He bought Pierre a gas station to keep him busy. And then Whale found a few new hobbies of his own to occupy his lonely days. He became restless. And he became sort of fascinated with a rather sexual fantasy world that he thought about a great deal and became somewhat obsessive about. He put a pool in behind his house for the purpose of entertaining. The fact that James Whale could not swim and hated pools was not a, not a factor. Uh, he actually used the pool as a way to attract younger men. And he had uh, men out by the pool. He, he threw parties. He was the decadent Englishman who was hosting these sort of Babylonian soirees around the pool at night. James Whale was a man who was leading a hedonistic lifestyle and hating it. He had men there at all hours of the day and night swimming. These were nameless, faceless people who would come because there was free drinks and free food. Whale was in serious decline, both mentally and physically. In 1956, the 67-year-old Whale suffered the first in a series of strokes. He had a second stroke, and that was much more serious. And he never really got better from it. Now, James was a perfectionist, wanted everything on his own terms. The strokes put an end to Whale's poolside romps and left him profoundly depressed. James Whale got to the point where life was no longer worth living for him. He was ill. He was lonely, and uh, I think he realized that the only thing that really uh, was left for him was a life of severe illness and possibly being institutionalized. On the morning of May 29th, 1957, he plotted, I think, very deliberately to have his nurse take the day off. He put on his most elegant suit. He did it with wit. He took the book, Don't Drink the Water, left it on his bedstand. He wrote a note to his family and friends stating, in effect, that he was being released from the torment that he had known for the last couple of years and not to grieve for him. And then he went out to the shallow end of the pool and threw himself in head first. He struck his forehead on the side of the pool, and when he was found later that morning, he was dead. I think that uh, the uh, blow to the head the shallow end of the pool would have stunned him, but probably did not knock him unconscious. He then overturned and floated to the top and probably seemed rather mystical, you know, going back up towards the sunlight, perhaps even somewhat like a resurrection. As news of Whale's death spread, several people arrived at his home, including David Lewis, his ex-lover and close friend. In fact, it was Lewis who made a decision that would later create all the suspicion about Whale's death. As for the suicide note not being handed over to the police, uh, there was a very simple reason f for that. In those days, suicide was a kind of social disgrace, and David did not want that. But Hollywood loves a good whodunit, and the lack of a suicide note, along with the blow to the head, prompted rumors. Could Whale have been murdered by a jealous lover? Well, no. There was never a shred of evidence pointing to murder. James Whale done it to himself. However, because David Lewis never released a suicide note until shortly before he died in 1987, the real cause of Wells' death remained a secret for many years. There was a coroner's verdict of accidental death, which I think everybody close to James felt was more dignified. Uh, on that day, he committed suicide, and he did it in the James Whale style. James Whale was a man who seemed destined to be misunderstood. One of his favorite stories was that he went to some 
revival of The Bride of Frankenstein with some of his friends. And they were laughing at the humorous moments in the film. Who's that? He's gone! The monster! He's got her! And he said the woman sitting behind him, because they were sort of giggling and laughing, leaned forward to, to him and she said, if you don't like the picture, why don't you leave? Well, that's what James Whale did. He checked himself right out of life. But you gotta admit, he did it with panache. The consummate directed right to the end, the shallow end. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time our paths cross in a state of mind called Hollywood.